years ago, people who had a heart transplant, the survival rate was anywhere from five to seven years. Years, And then it became, so the median became seven to eight years. Now the median, you say, is about 10 years. But tell us what is sort of new and exciting in heart transplantation. Well, there isn't much revolutionary going on in heart transplantation mm -hmm. itself. It's an evolutionary process. And over the years, we've fine-tuned the medications that we give people for rejection. And we've made advances in the antibiotics we give them to protect against infection. And we've learned a lot about what to look for in terms of medical complications of transplantation. So as time has gone on, the survival rates have improved mm -hmm. uh, to the point now where the median survival is about 10 years. So that Andy's gone 29 years, we're all very proud of. Wow, this, that is incredible. But the, the most common reasons for that someone needs a heart transplant, apart from a massive heart attack, is usually what? Well, the broad term for a heart that doesn't work anymore is a heart with a cardiomyopathy, and that just means the heart, there's something wrong with the heart muscle. The heart muscle could be damaged by any one of a number of things. About half of the people who require a heart transplant need it because of the consequences of long-term coronary artery disease, having had one or more heart attacks. And so that accounts for about half the people who need a transplant. The other half is made up of a number of different disease conditions, which could include a virus that might have attacked the heart at some point in the patient's life, uh, could be related to a complication even of pregnancy. It could be from an inborn genetic, genetic defect that it could affect one or more members of a given family. It could be the consequence of long-term alcohol abuse. That whole bucket of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy forms about the other half of the patients who require a transplant at some point. Who gets cardiomyopathy most often, women or men? It's men. Um, uh, coronary artery disease is mostly a disease of men, although women have certainly caught up <laughs> in the last yeah. 10 or 15 years. But probably 60% of the people who get transplants and are men and about the rest are women. Now you said women have caught up in the last few years. Is that because of what? Well, a couple of reasons. One is uh, women smoke. Uh, another is uh, women, unfortunately, uh, don't have, uh, uh, aren't, uh, often fall prey to the same dietary indiscretions that men do. Mm -hmm. um, and another reason is that um, we're diagnosing the disease better in women than we used to. Uh, now, I know of a, a person who had a heart transplant several years ago. She did survive for 19 years. She was very young when she was diagnosed. She was 32 years old. She was diagnosed right after giving, in fact, I think she was diagnosed during a second pregnancy, and right after giving birth to her child, she became very ill. Now, you said that's a type of cardio, um, cardiomyopathy that comes about with a second pregnancy. How common is that today, and what's the treatment now, seeing that we don't have many hearts to give to people? Well. Um a cardiomyopathy that affects a woman after a pregnancy is called a postpartum cardiomyopathy. It's a poorly understood condition. It's probably related to the immunology of the mother and the fetus. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps there's a sensitization that occurs in the first pregnancy that just is reawakened during the second. It represents a small percentage of the women who eventually go on, go on to get a transplant, probably less than 10%. So it's a fairly rare condition. Um, many times with medication and uh, other measures, the heart does recover. Uh, so not all of them are doomed to having ha a transplant, but a small percentage of them do not recover in any meaningful way, and they end up needing some other means to pump blood through their bodies to meet their body's needs for blood. Is there, what is being done today for these women that, because we have, I know at your center right now, you have, I think, 16 patients waiting for a new heart, and at Yale, I think they have eight. Um, so there are 24 people in the state waiting for a new heart, and the chances of 
all 24 getting a heart transplant is not very good, right? Well, it really underscores the importance of organ donation. Uh, it's estimated that 80 to 100,000 people a year in the United States could benefit from a heart transplant, but only about 2,200 actually receive hearts. And the reason for that is there's simply not enough heart donors to go around. Now, is that because the heart, the person has to be brain dead for the heart to be usable, or is that still true, or is that because people just do not sign donor cards, or they don't die in ways that make it possible for you to use the organs? Nobody, uh, uh, nobody obviously donates their heart voluntarily. Uh, right. And there are very strict criteria that identify brain death. Um, that are uh, unyielding and absolutely consistent and are um, judged by people who are not part of the transplant process. So mm -hmm. there's no conflict of interest in determining who's, who's brain dead. Um, you can donate, there are living kidney donors, yes, uh, uh, which they can do voluntarily and it's perhaps a supreme act of, of love and sacrifice to do something like that. Yes. Uh, uh, it is possible to donate uh, part of a liver, it's possible to donate part of a lung, um, but uh, donating a heart is sort of an irrevocable action. So that may be part of the reason why uh, there aren't as many hearts going around as, as, as there are other organs. But if people sign a donor card, if people have this conversation with their loved ones and sign a donor card, they can in fact donate six organs. They can donate heart, lungs, liver, pancreas, kidney, and small intestine. And by doing so, they can actually save eight people. One donor can save, serve eight people. So it seems that what seems to be missing is either enough emphasis on being donors or people still being a little leery about signing a donor card. Which, which is it, as far as you know? It's probably a little bit of everything. Uh, I think there is some misunderstanding in the community about what's involved with organ donation. There's an assumption that if I'm identified as an organ donor, the healthcare team won't do everything they can to save me. And, and I think that uh, the organ procurement community goes to extraordinary lengths to make sure that that, that sort of thing doesn't happen, mm -hmm. that th uh, the people who are responsible for identifying and uh, working through organ donation are not part of the clinical care team. They're right. only called in by the clinical care team when the time is right. They aren't involved with the, with the, uh, the brain death examination mm -hmm. that's done by an impartial third party. So I, I think the fears of many are probably unfounded. They're understandable, but they're unfounded. So if more people would sign donor cards, that makes it possible that when they have you know, an accidental death, um, because we can't use the organs if the people are very old and the organs are not healthy, but if more people would sign donor cards, we would have more healthy organs to be transplanted.